Welcome to the Why I'll Never Make It podcast. I am Patrick Oliver Jones. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is a bite sized edition of the podcast that I'm doing. And this is to cover something that I've talked about and I promised you in another episode that I'm going to be talking about my jury duty. Now, what does jury duty have to do with not making it, have to do with entertainment at all? Well, for the first time since I've lived here in New York, I actually answered a jury summons. And the reason why it's my first time is because all the other times I was out of town doing a show. So this is the first time that I was, I just finished doing Annie and I was in town for the day of the jury summons. So I went, well, I got to do my civic duty. So that's what I, uh, that's why I decided to do. And another reason why this is semi-related to the while never make it is because I was actually on jury duty for two weeks. Now during those two weeks, I was really unable to audition. I think I went to two auditions during that time. One I wasn't able to make because of, of the trial. And so it didn't make it to that one. And then the two other ones, one of them actually led to a callback, which uh, had to finagle the schedule around to make that. And then the other one didn't lead to a callback at all. But all of my time during the day was devoted to this trial. And so it really did get in the way of going to auditions, preparing for these auditions. That was probably the, the biggest factor. So Jury duty is one of those weird kind of things that we all have to do at some point, but I thought, well, I'm just going to answer honestly, and I'm either chosen or I'm not. And as it turns out, I was chosen. And so I wanted to share with you now that I can talk about it, because obviously during the trial, I was unable to share or talk to anyone about it. So now I can tell this very interesting, it's a little complicated, um, but more in a, in a medical sense, as far as like explaining everything and the details of it. But the story itself is rather fascinating. So here we go. Here's the story of my time on jury duty. Marianne Benjamin Williams is an immigrant from Israel, and she came here several years ago had odd jobs here and there, but eventually settled in on nannying, babysitting. And answering a Craigslist ad, she found this couple that live here in Manhattan. They were about to have their first child, a daughter. So she applied, sent in her resume, she gave them references, they eventually spoke over the phone, and then eventually met in person at the Blutreich home in Lower Manhattan. Everything that was in the resume, they, they liked how she had dealt with children before. They liked her personality. They felt like she would be a good fit for not only the couple, but also for their first child, Ariella. And so Ariella was born, and for about a year, Marianne took care of Ariella. She got along with Ariella. She called her princess. And so there was a lot of warm feelings, good feelings, both between Ariella and Marianne, as well as Marianne and the couple. Now, her work schedule was kind of one week on, one week off kind of thing because of the, the couple's work schedule. And so that's why she was only needed part time. Then after about a year of, of good work, no complaints there, the couple is going to have their second baby. And so with that, they wanted to keep Marianne on, but then promote her to full-time. Of course, that would mean more money, more hours. In their mind, and they had heard from other friends of theirs, that bumping the rate up $1 is all you need when you had one child. Now, personally, that seems a little low to me, but that's what they testified, that that's what friends of theirs had said. And so they had thought going from $17 an hour, which is what she was originally paid, to 18 would be fair. But then the mother was kind of like, well, that, that, that seemed, doesn't seem right. She kind of bumped it up. And eventually the couple decided on, all right, well, let's do 20. So they sat down and talked with Marianne about the extra hours and about the new pay rate of $20 an hour. And that turned into a big discussion. 
the the father as well as Marianne, they kind of got into it as far as debating what should be the rate, and Marianne felt like it was not enough, and of course the Blutreiches only have so much money, and so they eventually were able to bump it up to 21, but that was as much as they could do. Marianne seemed happy with that, and they moved on. Then their little baby boy was born, and as it turns out, shares the same birthday as me, March 19th. And they brought Maxwell, that's the baby's name, they brought Maxwell home, and for the first six weeks of Maxwell's life, the mother, as well as Marianne, were there in the apartment to allow the mother to, of course, bond with the child, but also to give Marianne a chance to get used to not just taking care of one child, but taking care of both children. And so for that six weeks, the mother was basically with the the newborn, and Marianne was with Ariella, the now one-year-old daughter. And over the course of that six weeks, eventually the mother would leave and do some work outside of the home and would be gone a few hours here and there to allow Marianne a chance to be with both children. It was just a slow process of eventually letting Marianne be with both children to acclimate her to taking care of two children as uh, as opposed to one, but also acclimate the mother to eventually going back to work and being away from her children again. Now, during those six weeks, Maxwell was not as easygoing as Ariella, because in the first year, Marianne and Ariella got along really well. She was an easy baby to take care of. Maxwell, on the other hand, cried a lot more, was harder to console, and both Marianne and the mother talked a lot about ways that they could calm the baby down, to stop him from crying, to somehow pacify him during those times when he was crying a lot. He was basically deemed a colicky baby in the sense that he just wouldn't go to sleep easily, got cried a lot, and would would be rather frustrating on some days. And so through those six weeks, this is what they were kind of dealing with day in, day out. Now, Miriam was only there from like 8.30 to 4.30 or 5, and then the rest of the time in the evenings and on the weekends, the parents had both children. At the end of six weeks, the mother goes back to work. And now Marianne is the sole caretaker for both children. And the mother and Marianne were in constant communication throughout the days via text about what was happening, you know, going to the park or going to a museum or who was feeding, who was napping, just basically the kind of the ins and outs of the day with the children. And also the parents had installed cameras in different rooms so that they could watch. They weren't recording anything, but it was an app that the parents could use to watch and just kind of see what was going on and monitor their children. It wasn't so much a a nanny cam as far as like making sure nothing was happening because they trusted Marianne. It was mostly just to be able to feel like they were there and be able to watch. Then came May 18th. At this point, Maxwell is about two months old, and that morning he had had a cough and was having a bit of a cold, but overall was a normal day in the household. And throughout the day, they had been texting about, you know, okay, he's feeding now, he's napping now, this and that's happening. That was also the day, this is May 18th of 2017, that was also the day that a crazed driver rammed through a crowd in Times Square. I don't know if you remember that story, but I, I thought it was interesting that that happened to be the uh, the same day. And so they, they also had texts where they were talking about that in the afternoon. Then around 3 o'clock, a little after 3 o'clock, Marianne calls the mother at work, frantic, and says, something's happened to Maxwell, you, you have to call 911. And then she hangs up the phone. The mother doesn't know what's happened. Marianne didn't say why to call 911. So the mother is now completely frantic and worried and calls 911 and sends an ambulance to the apartment. Now she's about 15, 20 minutes away 
and she begins to gather her stuff at work and get in a car to, of course, go home. As it turns out, there was a police officer that was in the neighborhood of the apartment, and he heard the 911 dispatch relating that there was an emergency. And so he was actually the first responder on the scene. It was about three or four minutes after the 911 call ended. So he goes to the apartment and is banging on the door, police, police, you know, there's emergency, please open up. He does this for about two or three minutes, and then finally, Marianne opens the door and hands the police officer the baby. The baby, baby's face is blue, he's limp, he's barely breathing, and, and the police officer says, what, what, what happened? And according to the police officer, Marianne says he likes to chew on baby wipes. Now, Marianne says she didn't say that, but that was their conflicting testimony at that particular moment. But they both agreed that she handed him the baby, he doesn't know what to do, so he begins CPR, he begins back slaps, where you know they turn a baby over and hit the back in order to dislodge something out of the airways. Then a few minutes later, the paramedics arrived. The paramedics take the child as well into the hallway, and they're doing their procedures as well. Marianne is, of course, with Ariella, and the paramedics take the child, who is still barely breathing, and get Maxwell into the ambulance. The police officer and Marianne eventually come, come downstairs. Marianne wants to ride in the ambulance. The police officer says, no, you need to come with me. There's a bit of a argument there. And eventually she agrees to get in the car with Ariella, who at this point just has on diapers, basically, because it, in the panic of it all, that's all that uh, that she had on. And Marion barely had anything from the apartment. They get in the police car and the ambulance, and they all head to the hospital, which fortunately is across the street, but it's across the highway. So there's no real like direct path. You have to kind of go around the highway, up this street, back down the street, and then eventually get to the ER. Now, at this point, the hospital is prepared, ready, and also the mother and the father have been notified of what hospital they're going to be at, so they're on their way. And the emergency room team, they're just trying to get this baby to to breathe normally again, because the baby is heaving the, the ribs and the chest and everything that this little two-month-old can do to breathe his little body is just trying to breathe. Eventually, they're able to get some oxygen in him, sit him up. The blue starts to kind of go away, but they can't really like figure out what's, what's going on, what's blocking it. They can't see anything. And one of the reasons why they can't see what's in his throat is because his mouth is bleeding. And they don't really know what that's from. They're, they're asking Marianne, and Marianne's not really giving much. She's like, I, I, I don't know. I, I saw something white in the back of his throat, she keeps saying, but doesn't really give any further information about it. The medical professionals are just trying to figure out what's going on, but also stabilize the child at the same time. They had called a pediatric ENT from another hospital who finally arrived there, and he had gone from one hospital to the other, basically in his scrubs, because he had just gotten out of surgery at that hospital, running through the street for about 10 minutes to get to the other hospital. And he gets there, he's looking at this baby, which is still like heaving and just uh, trying to breathe so much. There was a medical term that we learned through the trial called strider, which is basically where a high-pitched sound that indicates that something is blocking the airway. What the paramedic ENT eventually did in opening the, the child's mouth, and the blood was still, was still there, but he was able to see an air bubble come up through the, the blood that was resting in the child's mouth, and that air bubble let him know that's where the oxygen was coming. He was able to get a small tube to go down through that air bubble, and then eventually got oxygen into the child's lungs, and that was when they were finally able to stabilize the child. Now, this is about an hour and a half after the child was, uh, after the 911 call. 
So for an hour and a half, this baby has been doing this with, with, the, with the rib cage going in and out, the breathing, the heavy, just trying to do everything he could to breathe. So finally, they've stabilized the child. And both the, both the doctors, as well as the, the paramedic, the, the police officer, they had been trying to figure out what was going on. They had talked to Marianne. They had talked to the parents. And so it was obviously at this point, then the child was stabilized enough to go into surgery. So they went into surgery. And at that point, Marianne says she needs to go back to the apartment to gather stuff up because Ariella had no food there, had really no clothes on but the diapers that she was wearing. And so Marianne left to gather things and then come back. While she was gone, the surgery went successfully because they were able to find what was in the baby's throat. It was a baby wipe. A folded up baby wipe was in the back of this child's throat, and that's what was blocking the airwaves. So, of course, that is a very unique and rare situation. And so with that began a process of, well, how did this baby wipe get in there? And different doctors were called, uh, child abuse specialist doctors were called. So they assessed the child, and the next day, so this is now May 19th, the next day they did what's called a skeletal survey. And a skeletal survey is, as it describes, it does an x-ray survey of every bone in the body. So one by one, they went to the different sections of, the, of Maxwell's body and did these x-rays. Through that x-ray, they were able to find that there was a healing fracture in the left humerus, which is the left upper arm of Maxwell. And they couldn't really tell what it was. They had just, it had calcified around a certain section of the bone, which had indicated that it was probably healing from a fracture, but they couldn't see the fracture. And it really wasn't until two weeks later when they did another x-ray that they were actually uh, able to see the fracture. And so the combination of the baby wipe, combination of the, the fracture, they then took it a next step further and started questioning people. Obviously, a lot of questions are brought up at this point. Marianne being one of the primary suspects because she was the only one with the children. And... They ruled out the parents because they were both at work. So Marianne was the only one left, the only adult that was in the apartment. And Marianne gave a story. In the grand jury, she had said that she was in another room, heard coughing, went in to check, and that's when she found that Maxwell couldn't breathe. During the trial, she gave the, the story that she was in the kitchen ready to feed Maxwell, and Maxwell spit up the milk, and that's when she noticed that he wasn't feeding. So basically, somehow, some way, Marion had discovered that Maxwell wasn't eating, couldn't breathe, and that's when she called the mother to call 911, because in her mind, she didn't want to be on the phone with 911 for 15, 20 minutes trying to deal with a phone call when she would rather be dealing with Maxwell. So that was her reasoning that she gave for having the mother do 911. So that is the case that was laid out and the chronological order of the events that led up to May 18th of 2017 when Maxwell was found to be choking. Now, before I go any further, I'm sure you're asking yourself, is Max okay? Yes. Maxwell did come out of the surgery just fine, had no lingering symptoms or ill effects from being basically without oxygen for that amount of time. So Maxwell's A-OK -okay and is a healthy baby boy, although he, he's almost two years old at this point. So no ill effects, all is good. However, all is not so good for Marianne, and that is what the prosecution set out to prove. And the prosecution basically took two different tacks in order to prove their case. And the first of which was to establish the character of Marianne Benjamin Williams. And how they did that, they actually showed that the resume she gave to the Blutrights, the 
IDs that she gave, the references that she gave, were all a fabrication. Her resume stated that she went to Columbia University, when in actuality she had gone to a university in Israel, her, her home country. And the address that she gave on her resume wasn't even a real address here in Manhattan. It was, it was where some office buildings were, but there was actually no street address with that number. She actually lived in the Bronx. And the references that she gave, while she attested to the fact that, yes, she did lie about the address and the Columbia University, that she actually did babysit two other families, but was unable to have their contact information. She couldn't remember their names, their first names. And so she had her roommate pose as one of the references. And then she tried to get another friend of hers to be the second reference, but that one actually never happened. So the phone numbers that she gave out, instead of being from the two references, were actually two friends of hers. Now, she owned up to the fact that she lied and that she did it all just to get a job. The other thing, though, that came out, and this is where she really got into trouble, was that the driver's license and the passport that she made a copy of and gave to the Blutreich family stated that she was born in 1981, when in actuality she was born in 1971. So she stated that she went in and photoshopped both of those numbers to reflect herself 10 years younger. Because in her mind, she believed that no one would hire someone who was 45, they would only hire someone who was 35. I don't know that that would matter. In fact, I would think that someone older would probably have more experience with children and probably know more of what to do when it came to children, especially if you're going to have more than one child. But, uh, but that's what she thought. And it was that falsification that led to two of her charges, which was forgery of a driver's license and forgery of a passport. All the other charges stemmed from her allegations of what she did to Maxwell. That was the assault, the strangulation, endangerment of a child, negligence of a child, and finally, attempted murder. That was the big one. So when it came time for us, the jury, to decide and make a verdict, it basically came down to all of the expert medical testimony that, that came out over the two weeks. And the biggest distinction between the prosecution and the defense was in their theories or opinions, medical opinions, about what happened. And the biggest difference was when it came to how could a baby wipe get down a baby's throat? And the doctors who examined Maxwell had one basic theory that it couldn't be accidental. It had to have been forced down. And it had to have been forced down with a sharp instrument. Because remember that blood in the mouth that I had mentioned? Well, that was from two cuts, one in the baby's tongue and one on the soft palate in the back of the baby's mouth. So those cuts, coupled with the fact of a baby wipe down, led them to believe that there must have been some instrument, and it was sharp, that forced the baby wipe down the throat. Because... As far as a baby putting it in its own mouth, as far as Ariella, as a one-year-old, putting it in her brother's mouth, these are basically physically impossible due to the limitations, the muscular and developmental limitations of such small children. The defense offered one medical expert that said that, yes, that is a possibility that it was something that was forced down, something that someone else did. However, it is also possible, based upon the inner workings of a baby's mouth, that if you left the baby wipe next to the baby somewhere in the crib or in the rocker, that the baby wipe could have started to be chewed on, and then it would ball up in the baby's mouth and could be ingested somehow in that way. And that was a possibility of it happening accidentally. So there was some conflict there, but... Ultimately, the overwhelming evidence seemed to point in the fact that this wasn't any accident. Because remember, the baby wipe was six inches by eight inches. 
And maybe a little peace could get in a baby's mouth, but it seemed overwhelmingly that this was placed there and then forced there. So when it came time to deliberate, we, the jury, kind of tackled one of the charges, assault, over the charge of attempted murder. We wanted to kind of see where everyone was thinking when it came to guilt or innocence. And when we took our first vote, there was one holdout of the assault charge. Everyone voted guilty except for one. And through some talking it out and kind of coming, kind of wrestling with her own questions about it, she became convinced that, okay, there must have been the intent, there must have been the intent to cause serious physical harm, so she voted guilty. Now, where she and I actually both doubted was the attempted murder charge. That was probably that was probably the biggest discussion that we had in the jury room. And we I just I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that she intended to kill the baby based upon the evidence. Like I could go along with the fact that she actually as horrific as it sounds, that she shoved the baby wipe into the baby's mouth. The baby was crying, the baby was just whining and couldn't be consoled and the frustration got to her and she just wanted to shut the baby up. Okay, I can go with that. And the evidence would lend towards that. You know, the fact that the baby was known to be crying all the time. And the evidence pointed toward that. So I wasn't... So while... So while none of us are going to know exactly what happened... There's certainly enough evidence to point to the fact that that was intentional, to hurt the baby. Okay, but to kill the baby, I I didn't see anything in the evidence that led to, that would lead me to think that she wanted to kill, to murder the baby, because that, that, that that's a big line, you know. Wanting to hurt someone is quite common, I guess, you know, we, we all get angry, we all get frustrated, we all, you know, want to do something with someone that we're arguing with or disagree with, or, you know, th- that, those kind of passions can rise. I, I get that. But murder, I think, is a very, thankfully, it's a very rare, it's a very rare emotion for most people to have. And so, in the course of discussing me and this other woman who were doubting the attempted murder, we basically talked out our doubts and was like, well, I, I just don't see the intent. I don't see the actual, I don't see the actual, I don't see the actual evidence pointing to the fact that she wanted to murder this child. Now, the judge had pointed out that attempted murder doesn't involve premeditation, it doesn't involve an actual thought or planned out way to kill someone. It can be a momentary, it can be an instantaneous momentary thought of kill and then you can immediately regret it or you can immediately stop. Or, But all it takes is a moment. It doesn't have to be a long time, just a moment of that intention to kill. And even that, even though it was just a moment, I, I couldn't, couldn't quite wrap my head around that. And then the other jurors started to kind of talk us through why they thought that she was guilty of attempted murder. And it really hinged upon two moments that came out as we were deliberating where me and the, the other woman who were doubting it started to come around. And the first was that, and the first was the testimony given by the doctor who first treated Maxwell and then handed Maxwell over to the surgeon. And he was also in the operating room there. And when the baby wipe was pulled out of his throat, he had testified that it was folded over itself. It wasn't just balled up. It wasn't rolled around. It was actually folded. And so that that would lead me to think that there was some thought into it. There was some intent for it to not just not just quiet the baby, not just go over the baby's mouth and shut up, 
but to actually go in and go in further than just covering up sound. It wanted, that baby wipe had other intentions than just muffling the baby. So that was one instance. But the other instance that led me to think that attempted murder was actually the intent was when someone brought up the fact that, okay, we believe that she committed this assault. She had been asked many times by the police officer, by the paramedics, by the doctors, by the mother and father themselves. Everyone was asking, what happened? How did this happen? And she never gave any details. So if she did this, knowingly did it, and then gave no clue as to what could possibly be choking the child, she, in in effect, was contributing to the further medical harm of the baby and knowing that if the child continues to choke, death was imminent because all of the doctors agreed that if it kept going, if there was no resolution of what was choking, of what had happened, then Maxwell would die. So it was those two facts that led me from reasonable doubt to reasonable certainty that there was at least a moment of murder, of killing this two-month-old in her mind, which is, as, ugh, as just horrible as that sounds, I think there was a moment of it. There was at least a moment of it, if not longer. Because... Like, think about it in your own mind. Like, okay, you're angry enough. Like, put yourself in her shoes. Okay, you're angry enough. You want to shut the baby up, and you shove the baby wipe into the throat. Okay? Now, at some point, the baby will start to choke, to cough, to make sounds, and want to get that out. Yet, you continue to hold it there, or what ended up happening, pushing the baby wipe further in. Now... The only way to get you past that choking and coughing and to continue to push that baby wipe in is not just hurt the baby, but end the baby. And while I can't wrap my head around someone thinking that, because I, I, I've never thought that in my entire life, that's the only reasonable explanation for why it would happen. So... That's what really took us the longest amount of deliberation was to finally convincing me and the other woman that, yes, she was guilty of attempted murder. And while it was unanimous, it was by no means an easy decision. Because one of the biggest things that we talked about in the jury room was whatever your decision, you have to be able to sleep at night and know that you made the best possible, most reasonable decision. And... I was rather grateful that the other jurors who were so confident she was guilty were patient with us, the two of us, who thought she was probably not guilty of it. And they really took their time to voice their own opinions, really understand what doubts we had and why we were thinking what we were thinking. And I think it was that patience that helped give us the chance to come around and see things the way that they did. And so while it was rather tragic to really affect this woman's life, Marianne will more than likely be going to prison for a long time, which is horrible in and of itself, but I don't think it can even come close to comparing what the family and certainly what Maxwell went through in that horrific ordeal in the hospital. And on that happy note... Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this story. It was certainly a fascinating process to be a part of. It was uh, time-consuming, yes. It was inconvenient to my schedule and certainly to my work and to auditioning and trying to find another job. But I think that it's experiences like that that makes you appreciate life, makes you think about life differently. And for that reason... I'm certainly glad to have done my civic duty. So join me next time on a much happier note when I celebrate our one year anniversary of the podcast. I can't wait to look back over the last year and reflect and remember some of the wonderful guests that we've had on the program. Happy holidays to you and yours, and I'll see you next time.